Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Congressman Pete Sauber's Telephone Town Hall. We are glad that you joined us. Tonight, you will have the opportunity to hear about many issues that are important to Minnesota's 8th Congressional District, as well as what Congressman Sauber has been working on in Washington, D.C. You will also be able to speak directly with Congressman Sauber to ask a question. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 3 at any time during the call. We look forward to a thoughtful and respectful dialogue. Again, press star 3 to ask a question at any time. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. This is Congressman Pete Stauber. I'm so glad that you all could join me for this telephone town hall. I will start this call with a brief overview of recent legislation, legislative action and then open up the floor for you to ask questions. As you heard Kelsey say, please press star 3 if you would like to ask a question. I want to begin by saying what an honor it is to represent you all in Congress. I take this responsibility very seriously, and it is forums such as these that help me better represent you in Washington. Since taking the oath of office over nine months ago, I have upheld my promise to stand up for Minnesota's working class. And in our part of the state. My superior national forest. Thank you for joining us tonight. Can I have your first name and city town you are from? Excuse me? Okay, my superior, uh, sorry about that. My superior national forest land exchange act builds upon the strong work done by my predecessor, former Congressman Rick Nolan, and codifies the polymet land swap. The PolyMet project will ultimately result in nearly 1,000 new jobs in our home of northeastern Minnesota. I also gave my full support of projects like the replacement of Line 3, which would create thousands of good jobs for Minnesotan skilled union workers. While we must continue to develop renewable forms of energy, we cannot shut out conventional affordable sources on which millions rely. More recently, I co-sponsored and helped pass a bill out of the House which would ensure our workers do not lose the benefits they have worked to earn over a lifetime. The Rehabilitation for Multi-Employer Pension Act, otherwise known as the Bush, Butch Lewis Act, would support troubled pensions plans so countless Minnesotans don't see their retirement security decimated. Before I proceed, I want to remind you once again to press star three to ask a question. You know, and just today, I, along with Representative Colin Peterson out of Minnesota's 7th District, we introduced legislation that would return management of the gray wolf back to the states. In northeastern Minnesota, we know that the gray wolf population is fully recovered. However, thanks to an activist judge living on the East Coast, the gray wolf still remains on the endangered species listed list. This decision threatened our way of life as the gray wolf's dramatic rise has meant increased contact with big game herds, livestock, and even family pets. Minnesotans know better than Washington bureaucrats on how to manage their own wildlife populations, which is why I was proud to introduce legislation that will empower state and tribal agencies to tailor a management plan that meets local needs. You know, I want to take this time to announce that uh, Duluth and St. Louis County was recently given a HIDA designation. That's uh, acronym for High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. This is great news as this program would provide St. Louis County with federal resources to assist in the coordination and development uh, in drug control efforts among federal, state, local, and tribal enforcement officials. As a former law enforcement officer in Duluth, I have seen firsthand the devastating impacts that fentanyl, heroin, and opioids have had on families across northeastern Minnesota. And I know that our law enforcement officers are doing an exceptional job combating this crisis, and this HIDA designation will expand their efforts. In various counties across the nation, the HIDA program has successfully prevented illicit drugs from making their way into our schools, homes, and communities, and I look forward to seeing the same results in Duluth and the St. Louis County area. Again, a reminder to press star three to ask a question. You know, as a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, I'm also committed to bringing our nation's infrastructure into the 21st century. 
That's why over the August work period, I traveled to, Su- to the Sulox in Su- St. Marie, Michigan, to highlight their importance to economic and national security, as well as the urgent need to modernize this critical piece of infrastructure. Every year, more than 75 million tons of cargo pass through the Sulox. In fact, the Sulox serves as the only method for transporting the iron ore from the mines in northern Minnesota to the steel mills in the lower Great Lakes. Unfortunately, the Pollock, which is the largest of the Sulox, is currently outdated and considered the weak link in the North American industrial economy, as one unplanned six-month closure could cost up to 11 million jobs. Fortunately, after my insistent, the insistence, the President included a request of more than $75 million for the Army Corps of Engineers to reconstruct the Sulox in his budget proposal for fiscal year 2020. This was a crucial step in fully funding the Sulox. I was glad to have the chance to publicly be an advocate for the Sulox and will continue to help secure the necessary funding to keep this critical infrastructure up and running. And lastly, I wanted to discuss my recent efforts to protect the Great Lakes. Lake Superior, along with the other Great Lakes, are national treasures, a key pillar of our economy and the backdrop of countless memories for our families and our friends. Protecting the Great Lakes has always been a priority of mine, so last week I helped pass legislation I introduced with other colleagues from the Great Lakes region that would reauthorize and increase funding for the Great Lakes Restorative Initiative out of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. I was proud to promote a bill that will bolster critical pollution control, endangered species mitigation, and ecosystem restoration, and I look forward to voting in support of this critical piece of legislation coming out of the House floor. As your representative in Congress, I'm excited to tell you that constituent service is a central function of my office. It's a priority. Whether it's helping veterans or seniors secure the benefits they deserve, coordinating a tour of our U.S. Capitol for the families visiting Washington, D.C., or flying a flag over the U.S. Capitol to commemorate an important event, or helping individuals navigate the difficulties of a federal agency, my staff and I are here to serve you. If you need assistance, then I encourage you to call my office at area code 218-481-6396 or visit my web, website at stauber.house.gov. Again, if you need assistance, please call our office 218-481-6396 or visit the website at stauber.house.gov. I'm so honored and humbled to have the opportunity to represent you in Congress With that being said, if you want to ask a question, please press star three, and we will get started with the questions. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you again for joining Congressman Pete Stauber's Teletown Hall. Don't forget to press star three to enter a question in the queue. All right. So up first, we have Wayne from Proctor. Wayne, you are now live on the call. Oh, hello. Uh, Thank you for uh, having this town hall. Um, I, uh, as I told, uh, the screener first, uh, I got the worst, best news. I got treatable lung cancer. Uh, and I just got my second radiation treatment today, um, through the VA. They discovered it because I have kidney stones. So they did an x-ray. They went, what's that natural in your lung? We tested it and, uh, and I'm getting really great treatment from the VA. Uh, and matter of fact, I'm in a study with the VA. They're studying the differences between radiation and regular surgery. Um, so I guess I want to know what's your plans for the VA? Are you planning on, on fully funding them? Again, like having these studies because it, they don't know if radiation, for sure, radiation has been doing well, but they need to do a side-by-side study to see if it is as good as they think it is. And now people can maybe get less surgery which is a heck of a lot harder on people. Uh, so I just want to know, are you, do you support this research that the VA is doing and other research projects? Uh, I guess, uh, how, what do you think the VA should be doing in the future? 
Yeah, Wayne, thank you very much for that uh, question. And I want to wish you uh, the best of luck and best of health during uh, this uh, process for you. Uh, so, you know, um, you know, Wayne, after you and other veterans, what you have done for us, uh, we must always ensure that we are standing up for you and our veterans. As Americans, you know, I believe I share a commitment to ensure that the benefits that this country, country promised you, that you are going to get them. You've earned them. We promised them to you and we're going to deliver. Um, you know, sadly, over the years, we've heard too many stories of veterans who have been forced to wait or haven't received the care or benefits that they earned, and this is absolutely unacceptable. And I can tell you, as the husband of an Iraq War veteran, I am especially dedicated uh, to helping our veterans, and uh, all of my, our veterans have a very special place in my heart, and uh, they are uh, I'm very, very supportive of them. You know, um, specifically, there's several... Um, um, VA or veterans uh, piece of the legislation, Wayne, that, that uh, I supported. The veterans access to child care, um, of course, uh, I supported that. The Blue Water Navy Vietnam Veterans Act that was uh, on the, in the House for some time, it, uh, it was eventually, um, you know, signed into law. And then the Homeless Veterans Families Act, the Burns Pits Accountability Act, as we know, uh, there's many people with lung issues. Um, uh, many uh, veterans with lung issues, uh, the, the Improved Well-Being for Veterans Act. This legislation authorizes, Wayne, a grant program that allows the VA to provide funding to nonprofits and community organizations that coordinate, um, like their delivery of services to veterans uh, who are at risk or uh, are at risk of harming themselves. So the, the, the military veterans... Uh, any legislation that comes in, uh, involving veterans or how we can uh, make sure that we care for them and, and make sure we uh, uh, those benefits that this country promised and that you've earned, uh, I am in full support of our veterans and always will be. And again, Wayne, thanks for the question, and uh, I wish you the best of luck. Okay, so up next we have a question from Tyler from Aurora on broadband. Tyler, you are now live on the call. Hi, I just was curious, um, you know, I enjoy living in a rural part of the state, but you know, part of the struggle is having um, competitive access to internet, um, which in today's market is very vital for businesses, let alone individual students. I guess I'm curious what your hopes are for expanding internet access across the rural areas. You know, Tyler, a uh, great question. It's very timely because I, I'm on the uh, Small Business Committee with infrastructure and contracting that has exactly everything to do with the expansion of broadband into rural America. You know, we've been talking about this. Or our society has been talking about uh, pushing broadband out to our rural communities uh, for many years, and, and I'm one that says, okay, we've, we've done enough talking. Let's, let's make the move. Right now, there's a couple things uh, that we need to do. We need to make sure um, that the, uh, the mapping of the, uh, uh, of the broadband is, is, you know, accurate. So when we invest in those places, Tyler, that don't have uh, broadband, we want to make sure we invest in, 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 in that type of um, legislation. And I, actually, I'm introducing legislation with Rep, uh, Rep, uh, Representative Jared Golden out of Maine to en enable rural counties to expand broadband uh, through grants, and we're working on that in that, in that uh, committee. You know, I've said this, and I think many of you may have heard me say this, a, a broadband, a reliable high-speed broadband is not a luxury anymore. It's a necessity. It helps keep our rural schools open and competitive. It helps keep our rural hospitals open and competitive. Um, and those are some things uh, it helps for our, um, uh, you know, the realtors selling our homes, when, when we have broadband, it, uh, it, it helps that because people aren't going to, um, you know, if you, if you have a home with uh, Internet access and then two miles down you, don't have, you have a home that doesn't have Internet access, those homes, the one that has access is most likely going to be the one that sells, um, in, in according to uh, many, many realtors I've talked to. So, uh, Tyler, the, the deployment of broadband across not only rural Minnesota, where we live, but rural America is a high priority, not only in the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, but in the Small Business Committee, because we know that small businesses uh, uh, can compete 
uh, with anybody as long as they have uh, that reliable broadband. And sometimes they, they're, uh, they're deficient when they don't have that reliable broadband. Uh, furthermore, um, I've had people tell me that if rural America or rural Minnesota had high-speed, reliable uh, uh, Internet connection, they would move their business out to rural Minnesota for the quality of life. And so we have the ability to do to really make some um, make some really headway on the deployment of rural broadband, but it starts out with the mapping. We have to do the mapping accurate. That's uh, not only the bigger companies, but the mid-sized companies have to come together, help us with the mapping, and then we need to deploy or invest in rural broadband in those areas that don't have it. So, Tyler, that's a priority for us. I I just hope that uh, that. Uh, uh, you know, we continue to have it as a focus and work on it and make sure it happens. Okay. Thank you again for joining Congressman Pete Sauber's Teletown Hall. Don't forget to press star three to enter a question in the queue. So up next, we have a question from Glenn from Duluth. The question is on impeachment. Glenn, you are now live on the call. Uh, thanks, All right, Congressman. Uh, since the Trump campaign had at least 38 meetings and 240 contacts with the Russians. Uh, we have the Ukraine report recently showing that he had, P President Trump had withheld aid before having the uh, meeting with him, along with the emoluments clause where you have all the golf trips where the taxpayers paying President Trump directly to his resorts and the other meetings. What would it take for you to support impeaching the president since he's clearly violated at least three or four constitutional uh, direct clauses in the Constitution? Great question, and again, that's a timely question, Glenn. You know, this morning, immediately after its release, I reviewed the entire uh, unredacted transcript of President Trump's telephone conversation with Ukrainian President Zelensky, and there was no quid pro quo and no mention of uh, withholding any military aid to the Ukraine. You know, impeachment is not to be taken lightly, and I think it was irresponsible for the speaker to bring forward an impeachment inquiry last night without having, without having any shred of evidence that wrongdoing occurred. All impeachment will do is further divide our, our already divided nation. You know, my constituents didn't send me uh, to Congress to engage in political games. They sent me here to work on the most pressing issues, Glenn, facing our nation. And I, I, I will continue to focus on protecting Social Security and Medicare, moderate, modernizing the crumble, crumbling infrastructure that we talked about in the, in the T&I committee uh, every week, lowering the cost of prescription drugs, generating economic growth in our communities, and, of course, creating fair tra trade deals, uh, you know, for the American worker. Um, that's, that, that's the, the whole – that's my statement on, on, on your question. Um, impeachment is not to be taken lightly. And uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, what she did last night, um, really, in my mind, uh, hurt the process in the House of Representatives. Okay. Thank you again for joining Congressman Pete Sauber's Teletown Hall. Again, don't forget to press star three to enter a question in the queue. So up next, we have a question from Gerald out of Duluth. Gerald's question is on Butch Lewis. You are now live on the call. Hello. Hey, Gerald. Hello. Hi, Gerald. Hi. Thank you uh, for having this town hall. And uh, once again, I'd like to say uh, thank you for reaching across the aisle to sponsor the Butch Lewis Act. Uh, my question is, because it directly affects my family, because we're part of the central state pension plan, and yeah. uh, what is the odds of this passing or going anywhere? Uh, uh, we're at a critical point in time. Uh, this is my uh, wife's retirement, and, and since I'm, I, I, I work part-time, I'm retired on Social Security and, and a disabled vet, but I'm grateful that I still am able to work part-time. Uh, uh, so basically, it's a critical, it's really a critical point to my family. Um, right. So. Right. Uh, Gerald, thank you for the call. You know, as a former union member myself, I know that America's working men and women have helped build this nation and will continue uh, to build our nation. And, and as I said on the campaign trail, I'm always going to fight to ensure uh, that the working men and women receive the wages and benefits that they have rightfully earned. Um, you know, whether it's opening the door for responsible mining or creating fair trade deals, I'm committed 
to introducing and supporting policies that provide good quality jobs, uh, you know, for all of us. And, um, you know, the economy is uh, currently doing very well. Our unemployment is down. Um, and I have to say to your question, Gerald, that Butch, Butch Lewis is currently in the Senate. It passed the House. Um, and, uh, and I'm very happy that I was uh, part of that push to make Butch Lewis uh, pass the House. And it's, a, it's in the Senate now. It's currently in the Senate. And I will keep pushing for its passage in the Senate. And I think that one of the things that we need to make sure is, is that, uh, you know, of course, our two U.S. senators uh, continue to push for it. Um, I, I did my work in the House, reached across the aisle to make sure that it passed the House, and I think that, uh, you know, our two U.S. Senators, uh, um, you know, we, we need to ensure that uh, Senators Klobuchar and Smith uh, do their part in the Senate to uh, get it on the floor for a vote, and um, I was very, very happy to, to, to uh, support uh, Butch Lewis, and we know that pensions, we, re we rely on uh, our pensions, we work our entire life and uh, we pay into the pension uh, out of our paycheck. And I think that we, uh, it, it's very responsible to make sure that those uh, pensions uh, uh, are, are taken care of. And so are you, uh, Gerald, you and your wife can, can live in, your, uh, in the golden years uh, with financial security. Thanks for the question. Okay, thanks again for joining Congressman Pete Stavers' Teletown Hall. Don't forget to press star three to enter a question in the queue. So up next, we have Thomas from Cook, and he's got a question on gun control. Thomas, you are now live on the call. Thanks for taking our calls, Pete. And you were a heck of a good, you were a good goalie, too. Not too bad. Yeah. Um, you, you being a ex-retired police lieutenant, um, I was wondering your thoughts on gun control and if anything's being done about it. And would it be different if things would happen around here if there was a mass shooting? Would things go a little faster with you, or would it go at the same pace? Well, it's a great, a great question. Um, and you saw um, in our in, in the in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, the incident involving Duluth East High School. You just saw our local authorities went through the process, and they gave an individual probation who threatened to mass shoot. Um, I want you to think about that. Uh, he was given probation after threatening mass shooting. Gun, loaded gun was found in a parked vehicle in the parking lot. So with that being said, I think, uh, Thomas, both you and I are, I mean, many of us are just sickened by the violence that has plagued this nation. Um, and as a former law enforcement officer, uh, I was a victim of two violent gun crimes. Um, however, you know, we, we want to make sure that the individual law-abiding citizen continues to have the right uh, to keep and bear arms to protect themselves or others from great bodily harm or death. There's a couple of, Thomas, there's a couple of things we have to look at. Mental health. Um, I think the root of, of many of these problems uh, is, is the human one, um, and, and mental health is a priority, and we need to ensure that those suffering from a mental health crisis get the care and support they need in an immediate and timely manner, and that means that when they, they're asking for help, that that door is opened, that they get the immediate help, not, um, not uh, uh, an appointment three weeks from today, now. And I think that uh, many mental health professionals and law enforcement uh, and, and EMS agree that the door's got to be open immediately. And then the second thing, Thomas, is I support the Mass Violence Prevention Act. In fact, I'm a co-sponsor of it. Um, it th this addresses the underlying uh, and repeated tragedies, including, the, including and, and I hate to say this, there has been some failure in law, in, in law enforcement's coordination and response uh, to some things. Um, you know, the Mass Violence Prevention Act will establish in a prevention center, like a fusion center, that would uh, coordinate in, uh, in intelligence, collecting anything pertaining to the threats of mass violence by federal, state, and local law enforcement. What that means is if you see... Um, a statement by, on, an, on the Internet by an individual that says, for example, I want to do harm to this and here's how I'm going to do it. We make sure the Mass Violence Prevention Act gives an opportunity for somebody to make one phone call. This is what was seen on the computer. We believe this individual made this statement. So the local authorities, in conjunction with the federal and the state and, and tribal authorities, can respond immediately, not like, uh, okay, we thought, okay, because this is a federal crime, uh, the feds will take it. No, we start with whoever gets that 
this, this fusion center, we come together and literally the Mass Violence Prevention Act says with, just within a few minutes, action, uh, the action is immediate. And uh, so I think that those are some things that, uh, um, it, that, that we need to do. And we need the strategic operational planning for mass violence prevention, uh, which integrates, this, this act inter integrates the federal, state, and our local law enforcement agencies and then provides a recommendation to the Attorney General on mass violence prevention programs. Um, and I think that it's important that, that from a law enforcement standpoint, we can, we can say, because when we know better, we do better. When law enforcement reviews its after action reports, some of the things they missed, and they'll admit. And, and when you know better, you do better. Um, and I think that law enforcement, uh, you know, unfortunately through these incidents have, have the response is, is getting better and better and the coordination is a must. And then the third thing, Thomas, is the, the background check. So a universal background check today uh, checks two databases um, and uh, the next currently pulls from the National Crime Information Center. It's that interstate identification. Um, and then the, uh, we have the NICS and then the index. Uh, the index is the third database. It's the third database that was created by the FBI following the, the uh, September 11th attacks on this country. And so this database, it aggregates the criminal records from various federal, local, and state agencies, and it provides critical information to the criminal justice community. And, like the index is, is it's utilized by local law enforcement agencies, our campus police, railroad security, probation officers, and prisons. So this uh, the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, um, I'm supporting that third element to be checked, but currently that third element isn't checked. And we've, we've been told that several of those incidents where those uh, uh, perpetrators, those, those uh, 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 violators, would have been caught using that third check. And I think that, um, the, uh, in, in, for instance, the Charleston shooter, had this third check been in, it, he would have never been able to purchase and I think the Department of Justice Inspector General would audit those reports and, uh, and and has and would have revealed that in the Charleston it would have prohibited this incident from the lead shooter um, you know acquiring a, a firearm you know so there are rules in America that clearly state who should be able to buy uh, a firearm and who should not be able to yet the government um, you know we're not using all the technology at our fingerprints to enforce the rules and, and this legislation um, the Mass Violence Prevention Act the legislation would really prevent guns from getting in the wrong hands without increasing the bureaucratic delays for law-abiding citizens. So I think there's a win-win. I think there's really a bipartisan effort in Congress uh, to put that forward. But, um, Thomas, great question, but I can tell you, I would much rather uh, be talking about the safety in our communities than, um, than what's happening right now in Washington with what Speaker Pelosi is doing. Okay. Thank you again for joining Congressman Pete Sabers Teletown Hall. Again, don't forget to press star three to enter a question in the queue. So up next, we have a question from Catherine Burquist. Catherine, you are now live on the call. Good morning, Senator Flaber. Hi, Catherine. Good morning. Good evening. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite well. Uh, I'm a handicapped person that... Uh, I'm not sure this should be going to you. Maybe should go to our mayor, but uh, there's so many places that you can't get into because they don't have a uh, uh, handicap push button thing that lets you in and out. I've right. been to so many many places this summer. I finally got well enough so I could go out and about in my electric chair, and uh, all the places that I can't get in makes me feel bad because I know our servicemen had a lot to do with putting those in years ago. And somehow or other, they've gotten lost in the shuffle. Well, Catherine, um, I, I, will, I will just say this, that I fully support the Americans with the Disabilities Act, the ADA, and, and, and I know that we must protect the advances made by this bill, and uh, I want to even uh, strengthen it. So, you know, I want to talk a little bit on a personal level, Catherine, um, when I was a St. Louis County Commissioner and when I was a Chair of Public Works and Transportation, we were doing a lot of road construction and, and we were doing a lot of, uh, you know, working on sidewalks and what have you. 
And I can tell you that that uh, the uh, you know director of public works, Jim Fallacy, and many others in this department, um, really we really took into consider consideration at the intersections how um, making uh, those intersections where the, where you come up on the from the road onto the sidewalk. We wanted to make those ensure they were ADA compliant. That was a that was a priority for us because we know that uh, that uh, persons with disabilities um, and, and I look at it, I say persons with abilities because we have to look at your abilities. I think that um, you know in a wheelchair or not you you have so much um, to offer um, this country. And so what we wanted to do is make sure that there was accessible um, sidewalks. And, and that was really a top priority, and it still is, uh, St. Louis County, and I'm very proud of that. And, and obviously, uh, Catherine, if you don't know, my wife and I are uh, blessed with a special needs child. And uh, there are times that uh, we have to push them around in the wheelchair. And uh, sometimes it's when, you, when, you ha when, when Isaac, our Isaac, is in a wheelchair where we really see some of the, some of the things that you just discussed on, well, how are you supposed to go up this ramp or these stairs with a wheelchair? I think it's important upon our country um, and to, to make sure that that uh, we are ADA compliant and to uh, you know make it uh, um, you know easy for you to traverse uh, our our country, our roads, our sidewalks, our elevators, and and you name it. So, uh, Catherine, just know that the the ADA is important and, and uh, absolutely critically important to us. Thanks for that question. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Um, so, like I said before, don't forget to press star three to enter a question in the queue. Up next, we have a question from Russ uh, from Chisholm. He's got a question on PolyMet. Russ, you are now live on the call. Thank you, Congressman, for all your help, and uh, I'm a supporter of you. I, I at one time, <clears throat> I'm retired right now, but I had a mining supply business in Hibbing, Minnesota. And so I'm pro-mining in, in a big way. I'm just wondering what the status is of poly PolyMet is right now, and if there's anything that uh, that uh, a U.S. congressman could do to push it along. Well, thanks for the comments, Russ. You know, Russ, Minnesota is blessed. We're blessed with an abundance of natural resources. You know, it really puts us in a unique position to not just ensure that our country remains competitive on the global market, you know, but it also is good for good paying jobs and hardworking Minnesota folks like yourself. And, and I believe that, uh, you know, uh, like many Minnesotans, uh, our, the, the state is a natural beauty. And I, I believe using the 21st century technology um, and, and facts and science that, that mining uh, both uh, iron ore and, and uh, copper nickel, they're not mutually exclusive. We can do both. We can mine and uh, keep our environment pristine. And, and I think that uh, through the pro-growth policies and, and really sensible regulation, we can unleash the economic engine. Um, to, to your specific point, I think that uh, where PolyMet is right now, I think, on, I think it's October 23rd, but don't quote me on that. I think that's the date where they're going to have the discussion or uh, arguments on, on PolyMet's uh, permitting process. And, and uh, I've always said that, that uh, when, when uh, a project meets or exceeds all federal and state regulations, it has to move forward. Um, and, and uh, you know, op opponents, uh, in some instances, uh, Russ, uh, continue to want to move the goal line back so the project doesn't go at all. And, and I think that... Uh, Right now, litigation is part of it, it, it's in litigation, and um, you know we'll see what uh, comes out on October 23rd. But I, I, even um, during the campaign and the, my nine months, you know I, su I support uh, 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 copper nickel mining. They've met all the um, you know the state standards, federal standards, the EPA, uh, etc. I think it's important that it can't it can't move, move forward because we're I believe we're blessed with these minerals in the ground and we can do it best in this country and I say Minnesota can do it best we can lead the country and we can lead the world because I want to get these Minnesota I want to get these minerals rust from Minnesota not China or Russia who have zero labor standards and zero environmental standards uh, we can do it best in Minnesota and uh, you know I believe we're going to lead on this so. Uh, Russ, we'll see, um, you know, where it goes, um, depending on what uh, happens in the court. So thanks for the question. Okay. Thank you, Russ, and thank you again for joining Congressman Pete Stauber's Teletown Hall. 
Up next, we have a question from Millicent um, O'Connell. She's got a question on Social Security and Medicare. Millicent, you are now live on the call. I'm interested in having Social Security funded, uh, and it can be, from what I understand, by in taxing all income would make the fund uh, viable. And also on Medicare, I would like Medicare for all with private insurance also. And that way, all of us could be covered by all the um, social programs that are already done through the Veterans Administration and the uh, Medicare programs that are done already, they know how to do it. And I'd rather that they weren't done by a private company except where people want private health insurance. What do you think of that? Yeah, Millicent, great question. I mean, the, the health care debate has been going on, um, you know, for many years. And, and, uh, and I've said this before, that, that, that if the Affordable Care Act were the answer, we wouldn't be talking about health care now. We know there were some, there, there were some really, um, you know, tough things in the Affordable Care Act uh, that, uh, you know, like the, the Cadillac tax. That was unanimously voted out a couple months ago, unanimously, and, uh, you know, rightfully so. And the individual mandate, which is, which is part of that, uh, now is not part of it. So I think that, uh, obviously, um, I absolutely... Um, you know, uh, support uh, Social Security, Medicare. Want to keep them vibrant and uh, sustained. And uh, you know, but one of the things, Millicent, that I don't, I don't uh, support a government takeover of our healthcare system. I think that uh, I think that uh, uh, competitive uh, uh, private markets is much better because I think we lose um, when the government takes over and uh, we limit choices, limit competition, and uh, you know, when we talk about Medicare for all, um, it, it changes. It will change the delivery system for, for our seniors. There's no doubt about it. And I think that uh, when we look at uh, the ability um, to kind of tweak what we have going on, put partisan politics away aside and tweak what, uh, what's going on, I think we can do some really good things. And I'll give you a, an example. Um, you know, I've co-sponsored uh, the Social Security Fairness Act of 2019, which eliminates the two provisions that have unfairly pe penalized educators, police officers, and other public servants across Minnesota and the nation for too long. And what it does, it eliminates the windfall uh, elimination provision of the government pension offset. So basically, uh, it provides retiree certainty to, to retirees who have devoted much of their lives to public service. And as a public service uh, retiree, um, you know, many of my colleagues, not only in the 8th District, but around the state, Millicent, have said, you know, we need to make sure that, that Social Security is, remains, uh, uh, um, you know, um, supportive and, uh, and that Medicare remains supportive and solvent. And that's exactly what we intend to do. And, and I think that uh, through bipartisan good um, legislation, Millicent, and we can do that. I firmly believe that. Okay, thanks again for joining Congressman Pete Stauber's Teletown Hall. Don't forget to press star three to enter a question in the queue. Up next, we have a question from Barbara from Duluth. She's got a question on insulin. Barbara, you are now live on the call. Yes, I want to know why drug companies are not forced to take responsibility for diabetics, uh, poor health care, and dying from the need for insulin when this is an old drug it's not research and development they're just lining their pockets at the price of people uh, Barbara great uh, question and I agree with you that's what we're trying to do I, I, I can tell you that out of the health uh, or correction out of the um, uh, Energy and Commerce Commission um, there was a it, it passed out of the ENC Commission, Energy Con Commerce, unanimously um, uh, provisions uh, to make sure that drug companies were transparent in their pricing. And uh, what happened was uh, it, they, when it came out of Energy and Commerce in a bipartisan fashion, unanimously to uh, make drug companies, make them more transparent on, on uh, their pricing, uh, et cetera, when it went to the House floor, 
Speaker Pelosi put three um, uh, what we call provisions, uh, amendments, that made it uh, partisan, and it didn't go through. And so what happens is we had Energy and Commerce, it comes out of that committee unanimously. It should have gone directly on the House floor. That's the process, directly from the House floor, Barbara. It's voted on. It would have passed almost unanimously. And then it would have gone to the Senate because they were waiting for it. Senator McConnell says, bring it over. And what happens is those partisan politics got in the way, and it's sitting right now. It's sitting doing nothing, and it could have been in law right now. So we need to make sure that we have a bipartisan solution for the drug companies and that uh, you talk about insulin, um, critically, uh, critically important. And I know there are some legislation um, specifically to insulin that we are actually working through and taking a look at and, uh, um, you know, as they come to the floor. But um, the, 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 Barbara, you and many other uh, folks have talked about that, that have, uh, like I do, uh, diabetics in our family. It's critically important that uh, we stop the, this, this political divide and do what's right. And uh, I agree with your statements. Okay. So up next we have a question from Brad out of Duluth. He's got a question on robocalls. Brad, you are now live on the call. Yeah, Congressman. Uh, actually, I had like a, two small questions in there. Uh, under the national do not call list, it's since probably about June, you know, they just, I get 20 a day. Is there anything the federal government's going to do about it? And two, it has to do with the VA on uh, the percent of disability. When you're awarded disability in the beginning, you know, you might get 30% or whatever. But as you grow older as a veteran, as I have, uh, if you get 30 more percent, you're not actually getting 60 because if you, I would only have 70 left, so they take 30 percent of the 70, which is 21, which would give you 51 and not 60. So it's a long process to try to get up to 100 percent after an initial uh, uh, certificate is awarded. Is there any way that policy can get uh, Change that policy has been in effect for you know probably since Korea. Yeah, well, I, I tell you what, uh, Brad, uh, let's go, let's talk about the robocalls, and we talked about the VA. Um, the robocalls, uh, we, we get them, I get them on my cell phone, it's, it's irritating, and that's why I co sponsored uh, the Trace Act, it, it which will stop these calls. And uh, right now, um, we are around the district. Um, almost all of my conversations with constituents and groups, robocalls or these repeated calls uh, to our, our cell phones is brought up. And, and that's why myself and uh, many other members have signed on to this legislation to be able to stop, uh, you know, stop these. And we, it, it's frustrating. Uh, I'm going on, listen, I'm going on the House floor tonight. I'm walking up the Capitol steps and the phone rings. And it's an out of country, no idea. And of course, I didn't answer it. But those are frustrating things for, for all of us. So, um, Brad, I, I heard you and many others loud and clear. And my, my co sponsoring of this act uh, hopefully will stop the calls. Now, reference the VA, and I, I, I don't want to, I don't know specifics and, and, and personals about uh, your uh, uh, service connected disability. Um, you know, but I, I, I do want to say that, uh, that. In, in, in our in our VA system, we're trying to make it um, we're trying to make it better, easier, less cumbersome uh, for our men and women uh, who have served to be able to um, you know get the get the service they need and, and not have to jump through the hoops. And not, you know, I'm a co-sponsor on a bill to help vets on disability to keep more of the money uh, that they deserve. These are some things that that uh, you know, a lot of people maybe back in the district don't see, but we're working on, on legislation and in particular for our veterans that, that can help, um, I should say, make the process easier and more transparent for you, Brad. Like the numbers you threw out, as you're talking to me, I'm thinking, hmm, that's interesting. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know, um, you know, those specifics on the service-connected disability and the actual percent. Um, but I will tell you this, 
Brad, we do. Uh, our staff is uh, the number one priority is constituent services. So I, if you need uh, help, you may call our office and uh, we will connect you with, with, with um, a staff member that specializes in uh, VA uh, benefits, et cetera, and she's an exceptional, exceptional and knowledgeable uh, staff member. Uh, so you just need to call our office and ask for Margaret. Okay, thank you for that question. Up next, we have a question from Zach out of Duluth. He has a question about uh, delisting the gray wolf. Zach, you are now live on the call. Hi, yeah, I had um, two sort of environmental questions. One, what is your plan to keep the gray wolf from ever being close to extinction again? And two, what is your plan on building the renewable energy that you mentioned that we need to work on? Because so far, all I've heard was support for mining. Uh, Zach, let's, yeah, Zach, let's do the, uh, the gray wolf again. Um, in 2013, the Obama administration agreed that the gray wolf could be delisted off the Endangered Species Act and allow the states, and in our case the Minnesota DNR, uh, to monitor uh, the health uh, and well-being of the gray wolf. Uh, however, that became, we had some uh, folks that sued the Obama administration, went to court, and uh, what I would say an activist judge out of Washington, D.C., of all sp places, ruled that uh, the Obama administration was wrong and the delisting of the gray wolf will not happen, and they're going back on the endangered species list. And so I believe, uh, it, I believe in the Minnesota DNR. I believe that they can monitor our gray wolf situation. Um, I'm hearing it from the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association, our farmers, and uh, just recently in Duluth, uh, there was a wolf attack uh, when the owner uh, was 10 feet away. So um, it, it is uh, the, the, the delisting is, is good, and I believe that the Minnesota DNR uh, can do a very good job of monitoring uh, the gray wolf. Uh, we have uh, uh, states in Wisconsin, bipartisan, by the way, bipartisan support for this, not only out of Minnesota, you know, like myself and Call and Peterson and District 7 are, are, are sponsoring it together, and we have uh, our reps out of uh, Wisconsin and Michigan as well. Um, so a renewable energy, great question. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, the ability for, to have wind and, and solar and electric vehicles. And I think it's um, very important to let you know that I'm a co-sponsor of legis legislation uh, to expedite permitting for renewable energy projects on federal lands. You know, I support an all of the above energy policy. And of course, mining, as you know, uh, Zach, mining is needed for renewable energy. Um, if we're going to get uh, those critical minerals we need, uh, for instance, copper for the windmills, um, um, nickel for the batteries and, and what have you, we can get them here. I would rather, like I said earlier on the phone call, Zach, I would rather get the minerals um, um, that uh, we can mine here with our standards and our uh, labor force rather than the countries of China or India who have neither uh, and who are the biggest pollutants. Um, so um, I'm sponsoring the renewable energy legislation, carbon capture legislation, and I think those are those are and those are bipartisan, uh, bipartisan support for those, and uh, you know, and look forward to continuing to do that. So thank you uh, very much, Zach, for the call. Okay, thank you, Zach. Um, just a reminder: to press star three to enter a question in the queue. Up next, we have a question from Emily out of Duluth. Um, she's got a question about pre-existing conditions. Emily, you are now live on the call. Yes, thank you, and thank you, Congressman Sauer. Um, I had a question on pre-existing conditions. Uh, I have a family member who I believe probably wouldn't be alive today if, they, if we still had those restrictions in place that we had previously. Um, and I'm a little concerned with the way that talks have happened in the last year or so with regards to healthcare, specifically for folks with pre-existing conditions. I know um, Minnesota and other um, states, we have a few more protections that obviously I would want to see keep, but on a national level, um, I would like to have an answer from you about why specifically you voted against one of the bills that would have protected 
that for more people, and then I would like to hear from you about, um, I know you talked about the transparency in costs for medications, which I agree with, and I think that's a great start. Um, but when you talk about competition with drug companies, we have competition with drug, drug companies right now, and that's how we still manage to have these high, high prices for drugs. Other places in the world have a system of healthcare that is better, that is cheaper for everyone. And I would like to know from you what you see other countries doing well that you believe could be applied to our healthcare system in order to lower the cost of prescription medication and to lower the cost for me to go to healthcare. Because I know personally I make health decisions, unfortunately, these days based on how much I can afford. And I would like to um, have a congressperson who is prioritizing um, lowering the cost of health care for everyone um, across the board. Thank you. Emily, what a great question, and I appreciate the question. I will say that uh, you're, either you have incorrect information, uh, or, but, but you're factually wrong on, my, uh, on the pre-existing conditions uh, that you mentioned. I supported the pre-existing conditions resolution. In fact, I crossed party lines to support it. I said that on the campaign, and I voted for it. I also co-sponsored, I was a co-sponsor of the pre-existing conditions protection act and the continuing coverage for pre-existing conditions act. These pieces of legislation ensure that protection for pre-existing conditions are never eroded regardless of what happens in the courts. And I'll repeat that. I voted for legislation that protects pre-existing conditions and never eroded regardless of what happens in the courts. So I, I appreciate that the conversation. I just wanted to make sure, Emily, that you understood. Uh, I think you and I are on the same page in supporting uh, pre-existing conditions uh, because uh, you have a family member, and not who it is, but I know that my wife and I are blessed with a family member who has pre-existing conditions. So um, we're on the same page. And I think as far as, um, as far as other countries and what have you, I want to do what's best for the American people and that gives them the opportunity to control their own um, health care so it can be more of a personal policy for them and their families. And I think that's important. And that's what we're working on. Those are some of the bipartisan pieces of legislation uh, that we're working on uh, in the House to be able to make that your health care, make it your decision between, um, Emily, between you and your doctor uh, where, where it's, uh, you're driving the conversation and not limited by uh, government or, uh, or any type of uh, you know, government control. Because I think that you and your doctor – I know the best, and I think that uh, as we go forward, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing good uh, talks in our committees uh, on health care, and uh, it's, it's, it's moving forward slowly but surely. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, the pre-existing conditions are extremely important. So I just wanted to correct you, Emily. Thank you very much for the question. Okay. So we just have time uh, for one more question tonight. Uh, that question is going to be John from Duluth. He wants to know what the congressman is going to do to unite our country. John, you are now live on the call. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, basically, I was really gratified to hear you come out against partisanship and divisiveness in politics. I agree 100%. So I'm rather worried that you use the divisive dog whistle of calling a judge an activist judge because you didn't agree with the decision. When you do that, you cast doubt on the courts and you are in essence saying that the judges did not apply the facts and the law as they were presented in the court, but merely made them sound like a political branch. If the courts are last bulwark of nonpartisan behavior, become viewed as just another partisan branch, you have managed to destroy the country. And I know you don't want that. So if you would just kindly watch your language a little bit and be a little bit more neutral, it would be helpful. Thank you. John, great, great comments, and I appreciate the comments. One of the things that, that I'm doing 
in, um, uh, in to, to try to make this country uh, less divisive um, is I'm part of the Problem Solvers Caucus. Um, that means there's, tw- there's only 24 Republicans and 24 Democrats. There's only 48 members of the 435 in, um, in, in Congress that are part of the Problem Solvers Caucus, and we are gaining traction. We are the middle ground. We are the middle legislators, uh, like we, we like to call ourselves. We legislate in between the guardrails, John, and I think it's extremely important. I will also tell you that I took the civility pledge. I went through um, uh, down at the Lincoln uh, uh, Park School, the civility uh, uh, group of people that uh, we met. I took the civility pledge to be able to to uh, have the discussion uh, on um, uh, you know a good healthy discussion. Understanding we're not going to agree on everything, but there's not after we have the discussion and there is a vote or there is legislation, we move on to the next uh, piece of legislation. Um, and I think that I, I John, I, I I'll give you this hockey analogy. Um, a great great hockey coach and college hockey is uh, Herb Brooks, coach of the U.S. Olympic team. What he said, he said the name on the front of the jersey means more than the name on the back of the jersey, you mean, meaning we have that jersey that says USA on the front, and on the back, it doesn't matter what you name. We are, we are uh, USA members of Congress, and I think that going in there, the 116th Congress, there's many freshmen that have, that have looked at, let's be the class, that changes the tone in Washington. And John, uh, per the NPR, uh, I am the most bipartisan federal legislator in the state of Minnesota today. And, and I'm very proud of that. And I said on the, on the John, I said on, on the campaign, I'm not only going to reach across the aisle, I am going to walk over and build relationships um, across the aisle. And that's exactly uh, what I'm doing, and uh, I tell you what, it's it's a it's a, just a blessing to be able to represent um, the uh, the state of uh, uh, Minnesota, Minnesota's eighth congressional district in D.C. So, uh, everyone, thanks for uh, thank you for joining. It's an honor to serve, and and please do not hesitate to reach out to uh, our office at any time if there's anything that we can do to serve you. Um, and again, we can be reached uh, here in our Washington office, either at 202-225-6211 or uh, back home in Minnesota 8, it's 218-481-6391. So it's 481-6396. Okay, so with that being said, um, everyone have a wonderful night. Go Twins, go Vikings and Wild get a good start on the season. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.